chapter 4, verse 35. Knowing which you will not again come to such delusion, O Pandava, and whereby you will see all beings in their entirety, in the Self as well as in me. Even if you are the most sinful, excelling all the sinful ones, you will cross this arid ocean with the fleet of knowledge. O Arjuna, as a well-kindled fire turns all kindling into ashes, so the fire of knowledge turns all acts, even of past lives, into ashes. There are many actions that we perform during our life. Most of these actions are mixed. Some of them are white, some of them are black in the sense some are virtuous, some are not virtuous. They may be having evil intentions. But most of our actions are mixed. So we do certain things with expectations for ourselves, and so that is a mixed action, even though the result may be good or helpful or beneficial. So even if you are a very sinful person, a sinful person is one who engages in evil action. And even you are one of the most evil persons, still you can attain something and come out of this ignorance or this delusion. And you can see all beings in their entirety. You can see the self, the universal consciousness can be experienced even by the most evil of persons if they follow this path if they attain something so it doesn't matter what you have done in the past all these actions as in karma samskaras can be burnt away burnt up you let go the past and you can attain something. Many times seekers, sadhakas are very restrained. They have a, a, a very poor self-esteem. They experience a lot of guilt and they feel they are not good persons. They have a lot of self-condemnation. Mostly because all of us have done impure actions. Actions which other people might call evil or impure. And we do not feel pure. We know that we are not pure. And so we feel unworthy. But this is an assurance saying that the most impure ones can also attain. And just as a fire will burn up anything which you put in it, a blazing fire will burn away anything into ashes, so the fire of knowledge will burn away the past lives also into ashes. Very often, those who have attained such a glimpse, glimpse of samadhi, doesn't mean that you have established yourself in it, but even if you attain a glimpse of it, the person who experiences that, experiences it as a new birth, starting a new life. That is why one talks about being twice born. 
when one is initiated in the sense of awakening, that is like a new birth, like the beginning of a new life. The person may see life so completely differently from that point of time onwards. He's so transformed, it's like a metamorphosis, a complete transformation, that others from an external perspective may wonder what happened to this person? What happened to the old person? Where did he go? Who is this new person? Some of you may know the story of Valmiki, the author of the Ramayan. Valmiki used to be a bandit, a thief, a murderer, until he met a sage whom he wanted to rob. This sage asked him, you can take whatever I have, I do not have much, but you will create a lot of bad karma for yourself. Are your wife and children willing to share your karma? And Valmiki, the bandit, said, yes, of course, they will share these goods which I have got from you, the spoils of this banditry, I will share with them. So if they share the fruit of my evil acts, theft, murder, etc., then of course they will share the karma as well. But his wife and children refused to share his karma because the acts were performed by him. And of course, that's just <clears throat> a symbolic story. Naturally, we cannot take on other people's karma. The law of karma is very brutal. Each one has to live out their own samskaras. You have to pay your own karmic debts. So, Valmiki's wife and children said, no, it's not possible. Valmiki was so shattered that he went back to the sage, was initiated, performed practices and eventually became the great sage Valmiki. So this is possible, a new life, a new birth, purity is possible for even the most evil among us. Miklos asks, what does it mean? In the self as well in me, you will see all beings in their entirety in the self as well as in me. It means in the universal consciousness as well as in the individual consciousness. You will experience that divinity in your own individual self as well as in the universe around. Any comments regarding these verses? Any sharing questions besides that? Just remember that this verse uh, is a very beautiful verse that however evil you may be, how many ever sins you have performed, Papa is the Sanskrit word used, Papa means um, wrong action, uh, vikarma in the language of the Bhagavad Gita impure samskaras and we may not think of ourselves as evil or, or bad or even uh, impure but all the same all of us do have certain tendencies perhaps a tendency to manipulate others experiencing jealousy and 
because of that, doing things which are definitely wrong, incorrect. Lying to create a certain image about oneself. About oneself. A lot of pride, pride gets us into situations where we do things that we know are not really appropriate. So all these actions, we may not consider them as evil. We think of evil as some terrible, extreme situations like you think of serial murderers, dictators who have uh, caused genocides. You know, we think of these kind of people as evil. But we all have a little bit of evil in us. A little bit of these tendencies are there. Obviously not, I assume not, and I hope not, the extent to which would turn one of us into a, a mass murderer. But certain acts are considered especially evil. For example, in the Yoga Sutras, it is explained, certain acts are considered evil that you get the fruit of that instantly, almost instantly. These are fast factor fan karma. Those evil acts performed against those who are aged, very old. Evil acts performed against those who are very innocent, young children. Or those who come to you for shelter, who ask you for help, and you harm them. These kind of acts are considered to be particularly evil. And it is said that you get the result of that act almost immediately. On the spiritual path, I find this rather unfortunate that we do not discuss this aspect, the dark side of ourselves, often enough. There is a tendency among a lot of seekers to create this illusion that they are all very perfectly holy, very pious. And when they do have negative thoughts, evil thoughts, they are nicely covered up so well that sometimes the seeker himself doesn't really know that he has such thoughts. That is the level of unawareness that we have. So we all have that dark side, that impure side in us. And in order to develop and to grow, we need to come to terms with that dark side or impure side in us. Anybody would like to share? The process of burning these um, past samskaras is through a process of meditation, of witnessing. It is advanced meditation in the sense that we need to prepare ourselves and above all we need to learn first to let go our thoughts, learn to analyze our thoughts, get to know ourselves till we get to the stage where we have access to the deeper unconscious mind. And then when these thoughts emerge and we are able to observe them without being disturbed, then it is said that the fire of knowledge burns up the, this past samskara. What is this fire of knowledge? It is obviously not a real fire. 
it is awareness, it is consciousness. Just as darkness disappears when light comes, like in a dark room, you switch on the light, the darkness disappears. The darkness of the night disappears when the sun rises, light comes in. So, the darkness of the unconscious mind, the impure thoughts and the samskaras are burnt with the light of consciousness. When you become conscious of your thoughts, by that act itself, those samskaras lose power over you. And then these samskaras, they are known as burned seeds. The samskaras have no power anymore. Like a seed which is roasted cannot germinate, so these samskaras no longer have any power. Verse 38 to 40. There is no purifier in this world equal to knowledge. One who is fully accomplished in yoga finds that knowledge in the self in due time. One who has faith is intent upon serving the gurus and has mastered the senses attains knowledge. Upon attaining knowledge, he very soon reaches supreme tranquility. One without knowledge and without faith, of mind filled with doubt, perishes. One whose mind is filled with doubt has neither this world nor the other world nor happiness. Knowledge is not referring to book knowledge. There are two kinds of knowledge. There is aparavidya and paravidya. That knowledge which we use to carry on this life, like learning a profession, Book knowledge, knowledge which helps all of humanity in some form of other to sustain the life that we have, the way we know it. This knowledge is of this shore. That's worldly knowledge. But the knowledge of the other shore that eternal knowledge, that is paravidya and that is the vidya that purifies. And there is no other purifier equal to that knowledge. What does that knowledge seem like? How, how does one describe it? How, how is it? That knowledge is direct knowledge of pure consciousness. And you attain that in meditation through direct experience. Reading about pure consciousness, reading about meditation can inspire us. The lives of great sages, yogis, masters, are inspiring. The experiences that they share with us are inspiring. They give us confidence that we too can do it. But these stories and this information cannot give us freedom. To attain that freedom, that knowledge is required 
which is direct knowledge of pure consciousness itself. Only those who have that faith can attain it. If you have doubts, you cannot. A doubting mind will perish and will lead you to confusion. Faith is not blind faith, blindly following things or people, but reasoned faith. Best is, of course, that faith which is based on experience. Having had a glimpse, having practiced, having attained even a little bit of something, a glimpse, will strengthen your faith. And help you to keep continuing to walk on this path irrespective of the difficulties, irrespective of the obstacles. You keep practicing your meditation daily even though it is not easy to look at oneself, to see the samskaras within, to have that Sankalp Shakti, to do it day after day. And if you still do it and attain something, that will strengthen your Sankalp Shakti. Until one day you will attain the knowledge that will lead you to the Supreme. And you will be established in it. This knowledge, Paravidya, is the highest knowledge. It is priceless. And that is why this knowledge cannot be sold, cannot be given in courses, in teachers' training programs, in workshops. It comes through a relationship established with the lineage of teachers. With somebody who has walked that way before and mastered his or her senses. Such a person can teach you how to do the same. Master the senses may sound very difficult it does not mean control. Master or mastery means coordination, awareness. It means skillful management of the senses. And such a teacher can lead you. Anybody would like to ask any questions? Actually, I wanted to talk about the previous set of verses, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when you were saying that we don't acknowledge the uh, evil thoughts or the sinful parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was just thinking that it's, it's, a, it's something very kind of uh, deeply and early conditioning mm -hmm. from the society. Because it's, 
that kind of acceptance or talking about those things is not really encouraged in any society. It's, yes. It's seen as a threat to the family, to the society that we live in. Yeah. So eventually it feels like that it's not, uh, you know, um, to kind of suppress it is the right thing to do in yes. the modern kind of world. Yes. yes. And it feels like yoga is uh, at times opposed to keeping a cohesive society because the cohesive society depends on so many illusions that we kind of, uh, you know, project about ourselves, I think. Yeah. And that, that is a fundamental split between the <clears throat> society and path of self-knowledge, I think. Yes, I ab- agree with you uh, entirely on this matter, that getting to know oneself can create situations where you seem to then come into opposition with the conventions of society. And that is why many great sages who were very truthful and honest were persecuted, not just in the tradition of Sanatan Dharma, but in traditions throughout the world. Getting to know the self, the lower self as well as higher self, getting to know these, the darker side is the tantric aspect that is for most societies considered taboo. Which is why these teachings were never really given in public. They were only given to those students who were already prepared. That is why you can say that there is a split in the yogic and the tantric tradition where partly the yogic tradition is about doing certain practices and leading a sort of a Vedic lifestyle. The Vedic lifestyle is the preparation, the foundation of leading a healthy, pure life. Which does not mean that you do not have impure thoughts. But that is the hidden aspect, the tantric side. To go deeper within, explore these aspects in oneself and allow them to, in meditation, come forward and to be burnt in the fire of knowledge is a tantric practice and therefore we say in our tradition nadatavyam 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 do not impart do not impart do not impart because as you yourself said it very well put that certain it doesn't seem right the conditioning is so wrong that even if you want to explore your deeper dark thoughts, as I would say, it seems wrong because the conditioning is very strong. And therefore, for a lot of people who come with the Vedic background or the lifestyle, were very much opposed to the Tantric approach. And that dichotomy is still existing in our society. It is said, for example, that the Vedic knowledge is like a prostitute. She stands at the door and everybody can see her. But the Tantric knowledge is like the bride. She is very modest and covered in the veil and only the beloved can see her. And so it is that this knowledge of the entirety of Brahman, which is entirety, or the universal self, is a privilege of those who accept both parts as divine. If you reject one part, not willing to accept one part, you only want the so-called in, in inverted commas, the, the good part. 
and you reject the dark side, then you cannot go beyond duality to the non-dual. Yeah, I think, and what I find not very helpful is the labeling of, uh, or use of the word such as sinful or evil. Mm -hmm. That is, or I would rather prefer helpful or unhelpful. That is much more uh, conducive to <coughs> dealing with mm -hmm. uh, these things. Yeah, well, that depends on the way it is written, because if I would write and, and say you have helpful thoughts and unhelpful thoughts, it actually means nothing. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really say yeah. much. To say, are these thoughts useful? Are they helpful? Well, um, if I'm a very evil person, <laughs> I'd say, oh, sure, they're very helpful. <laughs> I just want to go murder somebody. But we do. Um, all of us are able to recognize evil thoughts. If I want to hurt somebody, I, I, I know that's an evil thought, you know. So that's very clear. In that sense, everybody has a buddhi that is clear enough and knows immediately what is evil and what is virtuous. But if you, you put it as helpful and not helpful, useful, not useful, that's little too vague because somebody may see something as helpful and the other one may see it as not helpful. I personally don't have a problem with the words sin or evil. <laughs> if I may say so, Ashish, you might have a problem with the words sin and evil because you still haven't come to terms with those dark, darker aspects of yourself, you know. Because when... We find them colored, we, we, you know, they're tainted because we have an issue with them. And um, no, there's no doubt that um, evil and good go together. Virtuous and evil go together. They're part of the same duality. So we come to verses 41 and 42. These are the last verses. I hope I didn't skip anything there. Yes, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> so these are the last two verses of this chapter. He who has renounced actions through yoga he whose doubts have been sundered by knowledge, he who has cultivated the self, him the actions do not bind, O conqueror of wealth. Therefore, with the sword of knowledge of self, cut this doubt that is born of ignorance, that is dwelling in your heart. Resort to yoga, rise, O descendant of Bharata. Doubting mind is what is always pulling us down. For the most sincere of students, most dedicated of meditators, these doubts keep, keep pulling us down again and again, repeatedly. We ask ourselves, am I wasting my time? Why am I sitting here doing nothing? Maybe I should go have fun. Maybe I should do something useful in inverted commerce. Why am I wasting my life? These and many other doubts. Is this the right teacher? Is this the right tradition? What am I do going to do, you know, with, with all this knowledge or information? What I, am I on the right track? These doubts are continuously pulling us down. But 
having attained something through practice, by letting go of the samskaras, by, by getting a glimpse, these doubts will be cut asunder. You will never doubt again. When you have seen it one time, nobody is going to be able to talk you out of it. You have seen the sun. You know the sun exists. I can give you many convincing arguments and tell you the sun doesn't exist. This is an illusion. It doesn't exist, but you know it does. You've seen it. It's obvious. It's right there. You know it. So also, when you see that light of consciousness, when the sun of consciousness arises in you and chases away the darkness, you've seen it even one time, you know it's there. And nobody can put any doubts in your head. All of us are living in modern life among people who are worldly, maybe even materialistic. And these people may cast doubts upon all the efforts that you are putting into meditation, into practice, into this path. And they cast doubts and this shakes you up. But have you seen it one time? You will only feel compassion because you have seen it. It may sound arrogant. I know the truth. You are ignorant. But one who has seen that will not speak like that because he is compassionate. Just like a mother is with the child. The child may say things she doesn't understand. But the mother knows, the father knows. And they say, it's okay, just a child. The child may be even rude to the parents, but the parents still forgive the child. Ah, it's just a child. When they grow up, they will know better and will respect me, will appreciate what I have done for, for the child, right? So, also, one who has had a glimpse is filled with love and compassion and would not be condescending or contemptuous of those who are still living in the world. When you experience that sun of knowledge and wisdom and you see it, then You are freed. All things auspicious come unto you. Why does Krishna call Arjuna conqueror of wealth, Dhananjay? Dhananjay is all prosperity comes to you. So he says, cast out this doubt with the sword of knowledge. Establish yourself in yoga. Arise, Uthishta. Repeatedly, Krishna says to Arjun, Uthishta, arise, awaken. Wake up, O Arjuna, wake up. He repeats this again and again. In almost every chapter, at the end, he repeats this again and again. Don't while away all these lives in ignorance. And if you are one of those privileged ones and this has come to you of its own accord, then don't let it go. Grasp it, hold it, be established in it. Arise, O oh Arjuna, establish yourself in yoga. Anybody would like to share or ask him?
We come to chapter 5. This is Karma, san, karma Sanyas Yoga. And here in this chapter, Arjun asks Krishna to clarify some doubts. The earlier chapter spoke about the relationship between the samskaras or karma and knowledge, jhana and sannyasa or non-attachment, how these were related. Yet Arjun is not clear about this. In the previous chapter, it was said that even the wise are confused in this matter. And indeed, Arjuna, who is an Adhikari, who is one of the, the best of students, is still not clear. He has doubts. He needs to clarify. And so he says, verses 1 to 3, Arjuna said, O Krishna, you advise renunciation of actions and again the yoga of action. Which is the better one of these two? Please tell me definitely. The blessed Lord said, Both the yoga of renunciation and of action lead to supreme beatitude. Between these two, however, the yoga of action excels the renunciation of action. Know him to be ever a renunciate who neither hates nor desires, devoid of the opposites of duality. Indeed, O mighty armed one, he is effortlessly revealed from bondage. Arjuna asks for clarity between sannyas and karma. So he says, well, you talked about the idea of sannyasa or tyaga and then again you talked about continuing to live in this world and performing your actions. So which is the better path, the superior path? Vashishtate. Vashishtate is superior. And Sri Krishna replies, a very clear answer. He said, both lead to the same. Sannyasa as well as Karma Yoga. Both lead to the highest. But between the two, Karma Yoga is superior. What does it lead to? What is supreme beatitude? Again, I am not very really happy with the translation. This beatitude is is shreyas, shreya, good things, the supreme good. So, some of you are aware of the difference between shreyas and prayers. Prayers is that which is pleasurable, and shreyas is that which is good. And we know the difference. For example, uh, wine may be pleasurable, but it's not necessarily good for us. Sugar, if not wine, sugar or sweets may be very pleasurable, but not necessarily good for us. The other hand, medicine, bitter medicine, may not be very pleasurable, but it is good for us. Right? So that's the difference between shreyas and prayers. And so, both the parts, sannyas as well as karmayo, both lead to supreme good. But, very clear response is that karmayo is superior. Vishishtyate, vishishtyate is superior. And why is it superior? Because renunciation is not about tyaga, merely renouncing worldly objects, but renunciation is about one who neither hates nor desires, 
one who is beyond opposites. And such a one is released from bondage. So, you can live your life in the world as long as you're not attached to the fruit of those objects. You can enjoy those objects and be released from the bondage. Also in the earlier chapter, this was explained that the world allows us to manifest those samskaras that need to be manifested and are very important aspect of our development. If we do not have the opportunity to manifest and live out certain samskaras, if for instance you have taken sannyasa, then it may lead to hypocrisy and that would be the cause of terrible internal conflict. You cannot develop if you have internal conflict. Internal conflict cannot be reconciled with um, one-pointed mind. These are two opposite things. Therefore, to attain a one-pointed mind, you need to do a bit of both. You need to internally renounce certain objects and the fruit of their of the fruit of the objects uh, sorry the fruit of the actions as well as allow certain things to be lived out and manifested This question from Krishna, sorry, from Arjuna, is really a reflection of society. Society has, through millennia, asked this question Should I renounce? In the Indian tradition of Sanatana Dharma, in the Upanishads, the scriptures are very clear. Sannyasa ashram is the fourth and the last phase in life. It is not recommended for those who are young and if so only in very exceptional cases because it can lead to terrible internal conflicts, very dangerous um, path to take for those who are very young. Once you have lived out certain desires and gained certain life experiences, at a later stage in life, one can take sannyasa, perform tyaga, renounce worldly objects. Any questions or comments to this? So everybody seems to be quite clear about that. That's nice. Verses 4 and 5 Only the childish argue about Samkhya and Yoga as being separate, not so the pundits. Resorting to either one properly, one attains the fruit of both. The place 
that is attained by the followers of Samkhya is also attained by those of Yoga. He who sees Samkhya and Yoga as one truly sees. So here the term Samkhya is used instead of Sannyasa. It's the path of knowledge and renunciation. And yoga here is referring to karma, or the path of action, or meditation. So it says only childishly people argue about it. Those who have real wisdom do not. Once again, here the pundits referred to are not scholars, but those who have real wisdom, they do not argue about this because they know that Either of these two paths lead to the highest good, the supreme good. So, in a sense, there is no need to debate. Both are good, both are appropriate if practiced properly. The issue is often that we do not follow our path properly and very often those who are in the world, are in this path, are in the world, have a part in them that is perhaps attracted to sannyasa, is attracted to renunciation. That is a path which maybe is a little bit interested in escapism. So we are not fully in the world. We are not really conscious. As a part of us wants to run away from the world, go off to the Himalayas, sit in a cave. A fantasy which I think most of us who are honest enough would admit to have having had, at least having had it, if not still having it. I have heard this so many times from people who have told me, oh, I'm looking for a great master. One day when my children grow up, I'm going to the Himalayas and I'm going to live in the ashram. The reality is that most of these people are not going to do that. And I know some people who actually did do it for a short while and then went back to their lives of householders because they realized that that was not for them. So, stay where you are. If you have decided to be on the path of a householder, practicing karma yoga, but then do it fully. Be there fully. And if you're going to renounce, take sannyas, then also remember, you have taken vows, you've taken oaths, then you need to follow them because you are going to be a role model. There are many swamis, there are many sannyasis, there are many renunciates who have taken to the path but then do not follow that path correctly. So then suddenly we find them going off track, they're falling, they fall from the path. They spend too much time with householders. They spend too much time eating and gossiping. They spend too much time, or too rather too little time in meditation. And they forget their oaths. Their oath of Poverty, the oath of celibacy, the oath of tyaga, of not gathering material objects. So suddenly you find the renunciate's own properties. Suddenly you find that they, they are not um, wearing their um, saffron robe. You know, if they have taken these oaths, they are given the respect that uh, is naturally um, 
given to them because they have taken these oaths, because they have made a sacrifice. It is because of that sacrifice that they are given that respect. And so if they do not make that sacrifice only um, but wanting all the same the respect to them, they are not worthy of respect. So whatever path you follow, follow it completely. And then one day you will realize, to your surprise, that either path leads to the same place. So practice one and you attain the fruit of both the paths. And what is that? That is another way of saying action in inaction and inaction in action. You are living in the world, but yet you are witnessing. You are sitting in meditation, but yet you are experiencing everything in your meditation. So you end up either way Either path you take, you come to the same place, the place of Param Vairagya or Supreme Non-Attachment. On the outside, the external, when an observer from outside looks at these two paths, he may think, oh, they're so different. We're not talking about a householder who's leading a materialistic life. We are talking here about a householder who is on the path of karma yoga, who is a dedicated practitioner, who is leading his life in a way that he is very conscious, very aware of a deeper purpose. Such a person and a, a sannyasi, a renunciate, are actually not very far apart. Because it's not the external actions or the outfit or the titles or the names that matter. The name and form, you know, Nama Rupa, name and form is not so important. Ultimately, what counts is the Bhava. And if the Bhava is that of non-attachment, if the Bhava is that of Vairagya, then it really does not matter what your name is, what you look like, and what you do. You are established in eternal wisdom. And you are a child of the divine. A ripple in the ocean of pure consciousness. Anybody would like to say anything to that? Any questions? Everybody is very quiet today. I think everybody is sunk into samadhi. Well, it seems everybody is very happy and content which is very nice. In that case, we end the session here and we meet up again next uh, Friday.
for a continuation of the Bhagavad Gita. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Bye, everyone. Most welcome. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Shanta. Bye, Miklash. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, 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 bye Krishna. Bye. Bye, Shibu. Sorry.